the date time functions. So the date time functions that we're going to cover will be the get date, date part, which lets you break out specific parts of a date to use it if you needed to use it programmatically somewhere. Date add, which is really handy. It's always tough to figure out how to do date addition yourself because there's lots of weird situations that come up there. Date dip, which is an easy way to calculate differences between dates. The blank from parts, and this would be date or date time or date time two or small date, different things like that from parts where you can pass in a number of parameters. And then that one I've tagged as 2012, meaning that's a new one that was introduced in SQL Server 2012. For those who are still using 2008 or 2008 R2, that one's not available for you yet. And EO, EO month, which gives you a way to easily get at the end of the month calculate the last day of the month. So get date's pretty straightforward. It's a function you call and it returns the current database system timestamp as a date time value without the database time zone offset. Let's take a look at this now. We'll jump into some sample code. We'll do our normal query training database. Drop that and start fresh. And then we're just gonna use the get date function. If we was, wanna get the time part out of that, we can use convert to time on get date and that will allow us just to extract out the time part of it. There's not, a re there's not really just a get time that will give us the current time. We just use the get date function using convert, or you could use cast there as well. Uh, there's some other options you can use to get, get dates and times out of the system. We've got the get date function we talked about, get sys date time, sys UTC date time, current timestamp, and get UTC date. Now, what I'm going to do is run all of these together and cast them as a time or convert them to time. We do that, we can see the first one here. We call get date. It comes across as 9.05 because that's what time it is here as we're doing the demo. Sys date time is 9.05. So we haven't specified for our current system any type of an offset. So the, the time of the server is in the same time zone that we're in right now. So they match, so they match up. The UTC date time, which is basically seven or eight hours for us, depending on whether we're in daylight okay. saving time or not. UTC time is 1600, and the current timestamp is just 905, so that matches over here, and the UTC date showing 1605. So you can see based off of these, if you're doing world calculations, sometimes you need to calculate the time zone in Spain or in Africa or something like that, not the time zone, but the current time in, in that place, and it might make more sense to pull the UTC date time out of the system based off your database rather than whatever the current time is where your database resides. Next, we'll take a look at the date part function. And this is pretty straightforward. It's a function you call and you give it a parameter up front and we'll look at all the different parameters that are there and you pass in a date. And you can use date set as a variable, but in this case, I'm going to be using just the get date function so we can look at the current one. But what you're passing in could be a time, a date, a small date time, a date time, a date time two, or a date time offset. So pretty much any of the date or time objects in SQL Server could be passed in. Here I've broken it out in a number of functions. I'm just going to highlight the first part here and run get date part of year for the current for get date, which is right now. When we run that, we can see it takes the date that's given and it extracts the year from it and it gives us 2015. The options we've got here, we've got year, which gives us what we want there, quarter, month, day of year, day, week, weekday. Now, the weekday will give you like Sunday through Saturday, day of the week, as an integer. And that's the thing, the return value from all these is, is an integer. You'll get the hour, minute, second, millisecond, microsecond, nanosecond, and ISO week. Let's take a look. We'll try running this and see what we get. As our results now, the year is 2015. It's the first quarter of the year. It's the third month. It's the 78th day of the year right now. It's the 19th of the month, it's the 12th week, it's the fifth weekday. So today's Thursday, Wednesday would have been the fourth, Tuesday would have been the third, Monday would have been the second, and Sunday would have been the first. So it's one through seven for the days of the week from Sunday through Saturday. We've got the hour, minute, and second of our time here. And then there's a couple other ones here that the microsecond and the nanosecond and then the ISO week, so it's in the 12th ISO week of the year. It really doesn't matter what your collation is set to or what the local date time format is. If you're asking for the day or the hour or the week, you're going to get it back from that date time or date or any of those different objects there.
The next one we've got is date add. And I love this one. And the reason I love it is because doing math on dates is always difficult. I don't know if you guys have ever done that like in code or whatever, but it's, it's a mess and it's ugly. It'd be nice if all the months were the exact same length and there were no leap years and stuff like that. But you've got some months that are 30 days, some months that are 31 days, some months that are 28 days, some months that are 29 days, leap seconds. I mean, not that that happens very often, but you've got to account for all that. What this does is this gives you, this does all the heavy lifting or the hard work for you. You just use the date add function. You pass in what you're adding. And in this case, we're adding one month to the current date. We could add uh, two months or 10 months or one year or whatever it may be. Similar to what we had before. So with all of the different types here, you can use similar types in the date add function. So let's take a look. Select date add month to get date. So right now it is March 19th. And if we add one month to that, it should give us April 19th. And you can see there our result shows April 19th. But what happens if we want to subtract, do a date subtract? Can we just call date subtract instead of date add? Well, not really. There's no function for that. So what we do is we just give it a date add with, or a minus offset. And you can see now it takes us back to February 19th. And bring down date add quarter uh, one to get date based off our current date, we are on March 19th, which is the first quarter. That should jump us to about June 19th. So we do the math and there we go. It shows up as June 19th. Independent of how many days were, I mean, I know April, May, and June have the same number of days every year, but if this had been jumping over a leap year with February or something like that, it would do the math appropriately and get us out to the right date. So if we went from January 19th on a leap year versus a non-leap year, if we're date adding a quarter, it's going to be one forward is going to be April 19th from January, January 19th, independent of whether we're in a leap year or not. So what's it do when you add a month to January 30th? That's, That's a really good question. So let's give it, let's give that one a try. Let's change this to month. 2015, one What it did at that case is it took the 30th of January and it added a month out. And based on whatever rules they have in there, they determined it wouldn't make sense to skip February entirely and push you into like the beginning of March. But let's see if we do 129, I assume will also put us at the same point, February 28th, 128, it puts us to February 28th at that point. So if you did 2016 or whatever the leap year is, right? 2016. So adding a month next year, because it's leap year, will put us on February 29th. So it, it accounts for all of that so that we don't have to deal with it there. But if you do 228 this year and you add a month, it's not going to give you the end of the month for, for March. It's just going to give you March 20, 28th, right? Right. So, so, so the example was if it's February 28th, and if you're taking February 28th, and we can do that right here, to 28th, it's not going to adjust it back to the last day of the month. It's going to go to March 28th. Date diff. Date diff and date add are kind of the opposite there. So what date diff does is it takes two dates in time and it gives you the difference between those in the different components. So if we said get date between now and something in 1492, that would give us the calculation of the number of years if we passed in year or we could get it in quarters or months. We'll start out here. We'll just say, give me a date diff in weeks from January 1st of this year to the current date. And when we looked at the date part earlier on weeks, we got 12. And when we run this, we get 11. And the reason for that is that we are, however, we are in the 12th week of the year. January 1st of this year was in the first week and the difference from between 12 and one is 11 at that point. Now, what if we had our order backwards? Does the order matter there? Well, if we run it with give me the number of weeks between the current date and January 1st. Well, in that case, it's going to go negative and show that that January 1st was negative 11 months. So let's take a look now. What I've done is I've taken January 1st versus the current date and I've passed in a bunch, all, all the different parameters here that are available. We can get our results back and see that for year and quarter, well, January 1st is in the same year and the same quarter that today is, so those show up as zero. For month, we're getting two months apart, days, day of year, and day. 
we're getting the same number there and then you can see the calculations all the way down where it gets interesting as we scroll to the bottom here you notice there was no result on these last two and the last two that were shown were to calculate microsecond and millisecond and if we look at our messages window you'll notice we got some errors showing up here that state it resulted in overflow the function returns an integer and the number of milliseconds or microseconds from January 1st until now of this year is more than you can fit in an integer. So we get overflow here. So that's just something you want to keep in mind. And you can't, I mean, the function does always return an integer at that point. So if you get overflow, I don't really know a way around it other than let's just do a smaller range. So if we take millisecond and microsecond and calculate between today and with no date, it assumes midnight. So between midnight today and now, and we run it, well, we still get an error, but we, we got the number of milliseconds from midnight until now, but microseconds still break. So we're gonna try between now and 11 a.m., which is roughly about an hour and 40 minutes or so from here. And that still gives us uh, too much big of a number. So if we try between 10 a.m., too large, we go between right now it is 919 so we'll go between like 915 and you can see that it is several million 286 million microseconds from 915 not every day are you in a situation where you have to be calculating milliseconds or microseconds but I just wanted to show how the overflow works there what it, what you're gonna this is really handy when you're trying to figure out intervals between any two given dates and it does all the math for you. And again, things like we talked about with leap years or whatnot, it takes those into account appropriately. On to one of the SQL Server 2012 added functions is date from parts. I just want to flip through a couple slides here because we have date from parts, we have time from parts, date time from parts, date time two from parts, and small date time from parts, date time offset from parts. So all those slides, we're kind of looking at similar things. So really what, what each of these do, does is it takes it allows you to take the independent chunks that make up a date, year, month, and day, for instance, or year, month, day, hours, minutes, seconds, if it's a date time, and turn that into a date object. Independent of the collation, this is always going to work correctly based off of this order. If you have a string in SQL Server and you just put in 2015-03-19, yeah, you'll get it to work for certain collations that will show up and give you the appropriate date based off of that. But based off of different locales, different collation settings for different parts of the world, that may or may not work correctly. Using the date from parts functions, it will return a date given the year, month, and day independent of the collation. You're safe here. You can always put it in in that order and you always get the date back. Date time from parts, similar thing. You don't have to figure out what's the appropriate order to format everything. Are we in whatever the location is, you just pass in the parameters always in this order and you always get back a time. Uh, date time, you can kind of see a trend here, right? Date time from parts, more parameters you get back, date time given that order. And date time too, it just has more precision than date time, but it also takes up less space in certain scenarios where you're not using that precision. So a similar thing there and a small date time from parts, year, month, same idea, you guys get it. Date time offset, very similar too. So the old way that you would have to do this prior to these functions, and I'm gonna throw a carriage return in here just to make it all fit better. If you wanted to get a date, you'd have to take your date time object or whatever wh whatever you're passed in, let's say it's a, and, and convert it, pull out 2012, pull out June, pull out the day, pull out the month, pull out the day. But then as I say it, I realize, well, Maybe it's not the month and day. That really depends on what collation we're in or what order we're, we're working with here. When we do this, let's take a look at what we get when we run it. We get, Ju we get June 1st. But well, we could have got January 6th, depending on a different collation. But here, year, month, day, when you use date from parts, it doesn't matter what collation you're in. You're always going to get back, in this case, November 10th, based off of the parameters that are being passed in there. Now, do we need the four-digit year on this? It's one of those things that comes up. Uh, we're kind of lazy usually, and sometimes we don't always put in the 20 in front of the 2015 or 2012 or whatever it is. Well, you don't need you don't need the leading unless you want to do it in this millennium. If you pass in 12 for the year, it takes it literally as the year 12. 
Can you do negative? Let's give that a try. Let's see what happens. No, it doesn't like BC or negative dates at that point, apparently. <laughs> then we've got time from parts. You guys get it, kind of a similar thing. We're going to pass in 11.15 a.m. and 20 seconds with a fraction of 100 or 100, 1.47 milliseconds with three digits of precision. There you go. We get it back as what you might have expected there, 11.15 and 20 seconds. Date time from parts, similar thing, you'd, what you'd expect there. Date time two from parts. But here we are, we're in, we get back to date time two with the precision there. Let's just say we're going to try and do the negative of year 12, so 12 BC, and see what we get. Oh, no, it doesn't take negatives on the year. So here's an interesting one where we're going to get another error here. When we run this, we get some of the arguments have values which aren't valid. Well, the reason is because we're passing in 147 milliseconds with one digit of precision. Now, that one digit of precision is going to take up less space when it's stored, but you can't put a 147 into it. So if we make that a little bit smaller and give it one millisecond, okay, yeah, that works. But it's not really one millisecond at that point. It's one tenth of a second or decisecond if there was such a thing. But if we want to go back to the 147 as number of milliseconds, we have to have at least three digits of precision here. Small date time, just a smaller way of storing dates and times, a little bit more efficient. We run that, we get down to... This is where it gets interesting because we passed in 2012, 1110 at 1115. We don't have any second accuracy on the small date time at this point. If you're doing work where you're concerned about the size of your dates and times you're storing, but you're not so concerned about down to the second accuracy, you can use the small date time for that. And then we've got the date time offset from parts. And what's different about this is we give it an hour offset, a minute offset that weren't there earlier. So this is like eight hours, so like GMT plus eight. And you can see when we run that, although we gave it 11.15 as our time, it shows 11.15, but it shows the plus 08 at the end of it there. And if you were going to do like GMT minus eight as our time, we could put a negative in there and run it, and that's our time offset. Oops. All right, on to the end of the month. As we already talked about with February, end of the month can be challenging to figure out, given today, what's the last day of the month if I want to do some kind of, I don't know, account reconciliation or billing or something like that on the last day of the month. It varies every single month. So what you do is you give use EO month and you pass in a date, or you can add months to it. You can say, give me the end of the month for January plus three, which would be really asking for the end of month for April. So I'm just going to declare this date time, put in 2012, 10, so November 10th. And I'm going to ask for the end of month for November, which gives us November 30th. Then I'm going to do the same calculation, but I'm going to give it end of month with plus one month in the future. The first one gets us November 30th, and the next one gives us December 31st, because there's 31 days in December. And now if we want to go, let's, instead of minus one, it's going to do the, go back to October. But let's do plus three, in my math correctly. That will put us into February and calculate 228, and that will keep in account leap year calculations there as well appropriately.